Hi, and welcome to this week's social media switch off. I am with the fabulous Cheryl Andrews, who is the listening detective. She's absolutely wonderful, to be fair. Um, we met at a networking event, and you know, we had this really beautiful chat just about life, just about each other. And it was just really great to get to know such an amazing person who loves to listen to other people and allow them to say what they need to say and allow them to voice what they need to say, but without any, any kind of anything coming back at them or anything like that. There is no judgment. It's almost holding space for someone, for what someone has to say. And I really wanted to get her on here today to speak about taming your time monsters and what that entails in terms of, you know, what are we telling ourselves on a daily basis? You know, what is our inner critic saying? And we'll speak more about what Cheryl does, what she's written as well. She's actually written a book. And just to help you master your own inner critic and to tame your own time monsters so you can excel and exceed in life. So um, it's great to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah. Yeah, it's lovely to have you here. I mean, obviously, you can, you've got a blended family, you've got kids and everything. Um, I can't hear your kids at the moment. I can hear my kids in the background. So yeah, like, I'm, I'm very lucky that um, <laughs> uh, always, my, um, I've got five children, but they've all left home. So um, not all, there's one at home and the other one that's home is at work. So he, he's uh, a key worker, so he has to go to work. So we do have the house nice and quiet still. But um, enjoy those moments while they're there, because I, I have to say I'm missing grandchildren at the moment. We don't get to see them obviously with the lockdown. But, um, but yes, I am um, more, more free with my time now that my children are more grown up. Oh, and that, you know what? It is lovely to have your time. And we were actually chatting about this, you know, having the time to take breaks away from things. Uh, maybe if it's social media, maybe if it's just a complete detox of anything. Um, but that time can sometimes be beneficial and essential for your mental health and your well-being. And that of others as well, because whatever, you know, we're suppressing and repressing sometimes goes out to, you know, sometimes spreads itself out as well. Absolutely. So we're just looking after, you know, cultivating ourselves and obviously cultivating others in the you know in the um at the same time yeah. so uh tell us a little bit about yourself how did you get to doing this amazing work that you do and we will go into that work as well so um just in case someone's looking for i don't come under the listening detect but kind of the company's called step by step listening so how i got into this is i you know as, as far as young as i can remember i have been um because I was sensitive to criticism, really, I didn't want people being upset with me. I wanted people to like me. I, I learned very early on to listen, notice what they liked and then do what they liked and get lots of smiles. And I, I remember my mum saying to me, she'd get up and she'd go, oh, look, the housework fairies have been. And I'd go, oh. so I, I'd know how to make her happy. From a, It was something I was doing from a very young age. And, and it set me up in good stead. Um, so I've been a manager, a, a sales manager. I've been working for Slimming World. But about 2006, I got to a point where I was like, the t I'm a natural talker, trained listener. And so I was a facilitator and um, I was talking, I was teaching and a lot of success was happening, but there was, I kept getting stuck and I saw it happening in my sales team. Then I saw it happening when I was a consultant with Slim and Wild. Then I went on to be an area manager looking after 25 franchisees, saw it as being a parent. And at this bit between people saying they, what they knew what they wanted, but then they weren't doing it. And I was like, what is it that's going to motivate them? How do I need to show up to, to create the change for that to happen? And it was around that time I signed up to be a coach. And I did my coaching training back in 2006 and went on to do some extreme listening training called Clean Language back in 2008. And around that time, I suddenly realized the power of being heard. So I would be the listener and I'd be get, you know, watching and adapting but there was, we were given this exercise where someone had to listen to me for two minutes and at the, about talk about something you're proud of. And they weren't to interrupt you. They just had to sort of nod and encourage you to keep talking. And then they had to describe you in one word at the end of it. And this lady had described me as courageous. And I remember this word sort of like not really resonating with me. So I was sensitive to criticism, but I also wasn't very good at recognizing 
when gave people gave me a compliment I couldn't really receive because I didn't it, it didn't I didn't recognize it as being me and what I realized in that moment was I was telling her all about the fact that I'd had the courage to, to leave my marriage. It was a big thing for me. Getting divorced was not something that I really believed in, but it really wasn't working in the marriage. And I'd had the courage to leave. And I was telling her about this. And she said, I must have said I've had the courage to leave. And she said, oh, you are. You're courageous. But in my head, my critic was going, yeah, but if you'd been a good wife, it would have worked. Yeah, you failed. You broke your family up. You, you've messed this up. So what I was saying outside was different to what I was saying or thinking on the inside. And that's when some of my curiosity came because when this person gave me feedback about me being courageous, which was my words that I'd given her anyway, it was like, oh my gosh, I've got a sense of what's okay about me. And so I think that was the, the, the catalyst for me to go, actually, there's something about this listening. Um, but I then set the company up in 2008 and discovered, my mum died as well in between all of that, so that I had a lot of grief to deal with. And what I discovered over the years is like, there's about eight different kinds of listening, but most of us start talking without knowing what kind we need and then just criticize each other for not listening or not feeling heard. Um, and that's really where my line of work got to now is that I actually work more with the individual, um, empowering them to chat with purpose. Are you just venting? Do you want questions? Do you need feedback? Are you just trying to get a delegate? You're just trying to delegate. You're just telling them about the programs you'd like them to do it. There's nothing worse, is there, when you describe a problem to your partner and then they tell you how to fix it. And you're like, no, no, no. I wanted you to just do it. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and, and my husband's really good at listening when I'm venting. But of course, I'll vent and vent and vent. And then suddenly I've decided I actually want him to ask some questions. And he's like, oh, he doesn't know that I've changed from this just having a vent or a download. So over the years, I've come to realize that there's lots of different kinds of listening. And so we have to know the questions we want, you know, what kind of feedback works for us. What do we actually need to hear and see when we're at our worst to get us back at our best? And what do we need to hear and see to keep us at our best? And, and it's learning that not everybody, particularly your partner, is not always the best person for, to do that kind of listening that you might need. And I think that was a big turning point for me. My husband um, is a great download listener. He'll vent. If I've got very clear instructions of what I need to do and when I want it done and I put it on a piece of paper, he's pretty good at doing stuff. But if I need him to try and make sense of all my confused words while I'm trying to get clarity, um, that's not his strength. He, you know, he's dyslexic. So actually tracking words auditory is not something that, will, that naturally comes to him. And it's not something he enjoys doing. <laughs> so if I say to him, can you listen to me? He tends to go, oh, I go, just for six minutes. And you'll go, okay, I can do six minutes. And yeah. so we, we talked about time monsters earlier. It's about knowing that it's challenging to listen to somebody if the other person doesn't even know why they're listening. And so if you don't tell them before you start talking what's the, what you need from them or even how long you're going to talk for, it's very easy for the talker just to keep going on and on and repeating. And it's all, it's all valid and it all needs to be heard. But the listener sat there going, like and they try not to say anything because they want to be listening but they have no idea what you want them to do with the information you're now sharing or yeah. how long they you want them to listen for um and so that's really how the journey's gone and there's loads of highs and lows in between that with mums and daughter relationship coaching and stuff that I could tell you about but ultimately that all resulted in um me discovering in 2012 that I'd created these great communities for other people to be heard but I still didn't have the courage to ask for help. And wow. so it was about that time when I realized when I was at the rock bottom that I needed people to listen to me. And that's when I had to start learning to take my own advice and have the courage to sort of say, and it started with my husband sort of, sort of educating about what questions really work for me. If I'm, if I'm saying a lot of this, if you ask those two questions, it will change everything for me. And him just knowing those two questions would really, really help me meant he could be his fixer and problem solver and he could be the supporter. But rather than telling me what to do, he could just ask me a question and that would change everything. Um, mm. And that's when I wrote the book, basically in 2014, 2015, I started writing about the clarity process so that other people had access to, to that kind of information. Wow. It's almost like asking someone, what do you need? Yeah. 
Well, we, we've got a, a process called Clean Setup that we use, which is a, a, a yeah. set of three questions, which is what, you, what would you like to have happen? Or if this was just the way you'd like it to be, it'd be like what? Now, sometimes even now when people go, you ask them, like, I don't know what I want. I just know what I don't want. Yeah. The thing I'd say is that if you are struggling with managing yourself, your time and other people, if you if you talk about what you don't want, that's like going shopping and, and handing to the shop assistant. I don't want bread. I don't want milk. I don't want eggs. And I don't want cheese. And they're looking at you going, well, where do you want, what, which aisle should I go to and get the stuff for you? And of course, if, whether it's you're telling, uh, you know, somebody that you work or live with, or you're telling your own subconscious mind, if you're talking about what you don't want, it's very difficult to get any help or for you to help mm-hmm. yourself. So I think the first thing is you have to sort of get clarity of what it is you actually want. Um, and I hate that when you start talking and you can't remember why you started the conversation and I can't remember what you just said. <laughs> but catalyst me then, I'm thinking, I'll come back and check with what, where we were going with that rather than going off down an avenue in case we get lost. Um, yeah. So what was it you, what was you said that triggered my thinking then? So uh, what I originally said was, what do you need? That's right. So the clean setter is you, you ask for what you'd like to happen. And then you have to ask yourself, how do I need to be? And then ask what kind of resource or support might you need for you to be like that? And the amount of times when I work with people who are really good at supporting and motivating and encouraging other people, they're usually stumped. They're like, I have no idea what I need. And usually we work together for a while and the next time they're triggered to feel like, oh, they're not getting what they want, it's only then we can unpack it and actually, while it's live in the moment, actually work out what you actually need to hear and see right now. And it's like, sometimes you, I just want you to tell me I'm doing okay. Or sometimes it's, I want you to tell me to buck up. Because actually, it's, as ironic as it sounds, all the positivity, sometimes we, what we actually need is to not talk about it and not go around in circles with it and just say, come on, get on with it. My husband's very good at the buck up one as well. <laughs> yeah, mine is as well. It's always like, just get on with it then. Yeah. Don't, don't tell yeah. me about it. Just go, just go do it. Just go do yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. And I think, and it, it's, it's when you can recognize that that's their strength and that's the quality they yeah. give. You need to know when it works for you and when it doesn't work. And if you know it doesn't work for you, then don't go to that person for the feedback don't go and talk to that person because that's not the or unless you can work in partnership with that person can suppress effectively who they naturally are for a period of time and that's where i'd say about the time monsters is when you start to know what you need and what works for you and what doesn't work for you and you start to cultivate a network of people and you go this person naturally into numbers if i go and talk to them they'll give me statistics and stuff this person is naturally someone that will just sit there like i've got a friend sometimes I used to think she wasn't listening because she never said a thing she just went <laughs> she was quite happy in the end I used to feel quite lost because I'd be talking and talking and talking and there'd be no real questions or feedback or opinions and I, and I used to make me feel quite sort of like lonely in the conversation mm. um but then I realized there are times when that's really really valuable and it's really that's what that's exactly what I need but I also recognize that's what she also needs so you'll have people that have their natural way of showing up that you, when you start paying attention to it, you go, oh, they're the best person to talk to right now because you're not asking them to be anything other than who they are naturally. Um, but that isn't always possible. If you, well, That's what my, my vision and mission is with the community that I've developed is that we are coming together and we're all learning different kinds of listening and that for short periods of time, we can adapt our behavior for another human being and put aside what we what we need and what we want and listen in a way that works for them. But if we are constantly being asked to do that, and if we do that professionally for a living, then eventually that's you get to a point where you go, when is it my turn? You know, <laughs> who's listening to me? Um, so I think it's important that when you you get to know what you want to have happen, what works for you and how you need yeah. to be, and you start paying attention to what kind of resource or support. And now my area of expertise is much more around what kind of feedback do you need? Sometimes people don't want any response. Sometimes they want a word. Sometimes it's just a, sometimes it's just, you know, a a gentle hand signal. It's it's nothing um, verbal. Um, Other times it would be obviously not in COVID times. It might be a physical touch. They don't want, you know, don't need anything. They just, or they just need an email with some statistics or facts in it. You know, we, but until you know what kind of feedback works for you, everybody else is playing a guessing game yes wow wow that is so true 
And, and then I say, well, you're setting them up to fail because yeah. everything they try to do, you go, oh, that's not working. Or you never listen. You, you know, all you ever do is this. And all you do. So again, we're talking about what we don't want, not what we do want. Yeah. Whereas if you can go, actually, do you know what? When you did that today, that really, really helped. That really worked. And you put their attention on what they did that works. And you pay attention to what happens when it's working for you. Then when you're stuck and you know you need some kind of a response to help you get out of you being at your worst, at least you can ask for what you need. Yeah. It's almost um, like, um, I suppose it's almost like when, when you're talking about people directing what they want it's just about them being more direct with and just saying this is what I want and more clear and as you said it goes back to that clarity that you it is clarity yeah being, you know just being clear on what you're saying as well you know that you know this is what I want this is what I need um and all of that just makes total total sense in what you're doing how do people focus on you know, on these practices? How do people really focus when it comes to listening? Because sometimes, obviously, for some people, I know that I'm definitely a waffler. <laughs> so, uh, so I like to waffle. But however, I can also listen as well. Yeah. Um, and I can definitely recognize myself in some of this as well. And I can definitely see areas that I've definitely worked on as well. And obviously, as people watch this and see this, they may recognize areas of themselves. They may recognize areas that may that they may feel me working on. They may not be able to articulate themselves in, you know, in such a way. And it's just um, them becoming aware, which we spoke about before we came on. Yeah. But how do they then focus on, you know, on either list on these skills? Because listening I feel is a skill it absolutely is a skill and we're taught to read we're taught to write and we're not taught to listen we, we people assume we know we're not even taught how we learn and um, we don't we're not taught to sort of pay attention to it so uh in the book um which we've mentioned briefly I'll just show it anyway so people know what they're looking for they decide to go to Amazon so manage your critic from overwhelmed to clarity in there is a seven-step strategy and I take people through literally the components of what I learned as a professional listener what mm. I was what was I paying attention to you said what how, what would people need to do to be able to focus and I, I mentioned that I've got the seven step strategy so I, I can talk you through the seven steps and the first one is the first thing you have to do is learn about curiosity that's what the c stands for which for me is about understanding um being okay with being asked questions uh being uh, asking questions it's also being aware that there are lots of different kinds of listening which we've already mentioned mm. but also remembering about the brain state so the, the thing I just remember about all of this stuff is the, the big I want to say is that there are parts of the brain that are hardwired to, to look for what's not working to keep you safe. And it's a pattern spotting mechanism. So there's a part of it that's going, have you got enough water? Have you got enough food? You know, and if there's anything that's any of the conversations or the thoughts you've got are around survival in that state it's very difficult to make decisions or to become self-aware or even to listen to somebody else, listen to yourself or anybody else. So, the first thing is you've got to notice that you're in those kind of states, whether your brain's in flight, fight or freeze and learn to talk to yourself in a way or get someone else to talk to you in a way that is going to settle your state because you cannot make decisions, learn or listen when you're already, your own brain is in flight, fight or freeze. So that'd be the first yeah. thing. The second bit, there's another part of the brain called the mammalian brain where you are, it's about decision, it's about um, pack mentality. What are the rules around here? So what time are we start in the interview? When are we going to finish? Will there be interruptions or won't it? You know, that just joking with that. You know, we've had <laughs> yeah. the joy of, the joys of COVID interviewing today. We've, we've had, we've got internet and little ones, you know, little one coming in wanting to, being told by no by daddy and then we're going to try and actually if mum will say yes, but she's busy so she might just say quickly and when she won't realise. That <laughs> is all down to when we don't know what the rules are, particularly with the pandemic, we've seen that happening. Yeah. Social media is a great one. We talked about that before. If we haven't created the rules that we want to live our life by with, that we haven't decided how much we want to be on there, how often, which platforms, that sort of stuff, then the mammalian brain gets get anxious because it's like it doesn't know what to predict or doesn't know what you need to do to stay safe without the sort of the pack of mentality attacking you. Awesome. So again, you have to decide the rules you want to live your life by, what works for you in order to settle that state of the brain or be able to ask questions to find out what the rules around here are with this person in this environment, in these, this situation. So the number one thing is to focus on 
where does your curiosity come from? Where does that, you know, what do you need to settle your brain first and first and foremost? The second thing I get people to focus on when you're listening to somebody else or yourself is the words you use, your language. Just actually, what do you mean by what you say? People will say to me, um, let's take the, the subject we talked about, your company, is it um, social media switch off? Yeah. You know, what kind of switch off is that? And I bet if we asked everybody what kind of switch off their switch off is, everybody would have a slightly different interpretation, a different definition. And what was working last week for switch off might be different this week. And what happens just before you can switch off and after you've switched off, it will all be varied. And so the first thing to do is if you're asking somebody for something, is check you know what you mean by what you say, because you'll have your definition, they'll have their interpretation, well, you're definitely gonna be in conflict if you didn't even know your own definition before you started. And they, they start then interpreting you, and we will all have our own interpretation. So yeah. the first thing is be, be compassionate for people's differences. Yeah. Um, but you have to have clarity of what do you mean by what you say. Um, and also be mindful of not being mean you know, not criticizing yourself or other people because most people can't listen to being criticized, which I'm, I think we're worse with our partners. We might criticize them a bit more openly. Oh, you haven't done that. Why haven't you done this? You know, we seem to be a bit freer with our critical stuff when it comes to our, our, our family life. Or maybe it's just me. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, rather than in, you know, when you're with your professional environment, we'll perhaps hold that back and reframe it. So that would be, if I was giving the first two steps, it would be how do you settle your brain to be curious and then pay attention to the language that yeah. you're using. Um, we probably don't have time to go through all seven steps, but that in the principle, there is a step-by-step -step process that I take people through to go, okay, now you've learned to pay attention to this, now pay attention to this, um, which will be listening to yourself for it or when you're listening to somebody else, that's what you could focus on. And that's a really good thing to go through. And it's good that we may not be doing the seven but it's good for people to get a grasp of the beginning steps. Yeah. Because yeah, sometimes, you know, the beginning steps are most important, aren't they? They are, they are I suppose, to say your foundations. Yeah. yeah. And if I, if I finish with the why, because that's probably where I'll give you the top and tail, the why is you and your story and the why, why for doing something. Often we make a decision mm. um, and we forget why we were doing it. So it's remembering that, when we can't listen until we've settled our own brain state that you know yeah. we can't listen to ourselves or anybody else unless our, mm. our, our own brain state is is, is stated there etc and, and that comes back to knowing who you are and what works for you yeah and paying attention to that so if going back to that sort of focus on what needs to happen for you to be curious and to feel safe to ask questions mm. to, to, to be playful with things that would be the first thing the, the why at the end is once you've made a decision, is of course, you, you'll have a story that you're telling yourself and it's checking whether that story is serving you. Is This is your life story that you're, you're talking about. When we talk about ourselves and we talk about, you know, are, are you the hero of your own story or the victim? Yeah. So it's like, how are you talking about yourself? And is that story, the way you're describing yourself, um, serving you? And the biggest thing is to update the story regularly because who you were 50 minutes ago 50 seconds ago isn't who you have to be today or right now so if you were a um you were a very calm patient loving mum like and I, I'm just like <laughs> I, was, I was in awe of you because I was thinking I'd be going goodness sake <laughs> <laughs> maybe although saying that I don't know I, I was fortunate enough the way I had my children I, I didn't have COVID to deal with them at the same time and I did homeschool my son um so I did have to I did do all that like I mean he's 22 so 10 years ago now um, so I have been through it before, but I'm not sure that I was, um, I probably, again, that might be an update my story. I probably was much more patient than I think I was, the way that I think I was behaving. Um, so I think it's really important that you think about the story you're telling yourself. Notice that you change and other people change, and we have to update that story, that version of us. So if someone tells you something, that they're, or they're angry, or they're sad, or they're jubilant, it's, all of those emotions are temporary. So when you've heard it, it's gone. That doesn't define them as you're always a miserable person. No, they were miserable for a moment. And that's it does and so there's therefore the story you talk about yourself or other people impacts the quality of people's attention going forward. So 
always think about how you're talking about yourself and other people because ultimately um, as you learn and you know better you'll do better but only if you change the story wow and that's so powerful as well and that's so it's so true you know as I mean we're always working on ourselves and I'm definitely still working on myself as well. So there's stuff that, you know, we'll always go back to and there'll be stuff that will always be like kind of ironing out. And even though we kind of move forward a little bit, we sometimes go back a little bit as well. Oh, absolutely. We're still a, little, we're still a few steps forward than where we used to I've be. Stopped, I've stopped saying when will I get there? When will I be completely fixed? When will I've got rid of all my baggage? And the reason is because when I say baggage, it's triggers, things that push my buttons, things that make me feel uncomfortable, things that put me into the flight, flight or freeze, things that will put me into that mammalian brain where I'm questioning things. I'm, I'm not saying things couldn't put me into flight, flight or freeze now because I'm sure if something shocked me or there was you know, some trauma, it would. Mm. But before, just somebody scrunching their nose at me and thinking, and I'm thinking they don't like me, would put me into flight, flight or freeze. I'd have a panic attack. I'd be, I'd be stressed over that. That doesn't happen now. But every time I do something new, I'm going to be in that, that unfamiliar zone again. I'm in a place of discomfort. It's my the brain, remember as well with the brain, it, it's got a, conf, a constant conflict. There's a part of it that wants certainty. Mm. So it wants things to stay the same. Then the other part of it likes things to be, so it likes the challenge of problem solving. So it likes trying to work out how this works and trying to work out what the pattern is to, to go, oh, well, so this happens. And then when Cheryl does that, then Trina asks that question. And, oh, that, this is how this works. But of course, when that keeps happening over and over, it gets bored. And so if we're not learning new things, what will happen is our brain will go and find a problem for us or create one of its own because yeah. it likes to have the challenge. It likes to grow. So we've got this constant battle within our own system and in, in part of the brain likes things to be something that's a problem to solve. It's like having to work out the pattern and the predictability and working out what's going on here to the other part. I'd like it all to stay the same and settled. Yeah. And so we're always as humans, either we get lots of change going on outside of us and our system's going, Oh, I can't keep up with this. Or it's like nothing's changing around us and we're bored as hell and we want something to change. Yeah. And that really comes down to, and that's where the manager critic really comes from, is that thinking about what you're listening to and how you're listening to yourself is the, whatever you're giving yourself feedback on the story you're telling yourself or the quality of your stimuli around you is what will trigger your reaction and your response to certain things. And if you change your focus, you can change the response. That's fabulous. That is really fabulous. And, and it shows that, you know, what you mentioned earlier about, well, we actually spoke before we came on here, which then goes back to courage. Mm. Having, so, yeah. You know, I, to, to articulate, really, and express what you need and what you want and why you want it. Yeah. And, and so I want to just say to everybody it does take courage to take this step to do the work mm. to, to be self-inquiry and what tends to happen I see people do it all the time is that they they perhaps haven't got the courage to do it so they're going to ask loads of other people's questions and they'll listen to loads of other people and trying to work out how their brain works and how do they want things and complain about their partners because they don't talk about how they're feeling however usually what's happening in those moments is that the partner hasn't got a problem the partner's quite happy being who they are it's the person who's doing all the questioning that's not happy with them being who they are. And so what happens is we start asking all these questions of somebody and making them think and making them sort of reflect on themselves. It's not easy. And so it does take courage. Um, and so it's being aware of, you know, just checking out and the T in the clarity process is like trust. And it's about taking your own advice. Don't do to others what you're not prepared to do for you, to yourself. So if you're asking them loads of questions, sometimes, and it's not always, by the way, this is just a, a sort of generalization. Sometimes we're trying to find out about everybody else to avoid having to think about ourselves. Yeah. We're busy helping everybody else because it means we don't have to look at ourselves. We don't have to look at our problems. We don't have to listen to our challenges. We don't have to find out that those, those niggles that are within our own system, but it doesn't work if it's all one-sided. So we have to be able to listen to, ourselves and other people and you can't just you know do the other way and 
And, and if you've got somebody who has been prepared to um, express themselves, if you, they've allowed you to listen, you might feel it's a, um, a responsibility or even a chore to listen to somebody. But if somebody has the courage to speak to you, what I say to you is it takes, when someone gives you their, their, their rawness, their, their, their authenticity, their unedited, muddled up confusion of stuff, and they present it to you, often all that's needed is for it to be witnessed without shame, without judgment, just to be honored in that moment. And, and that isn't easy if you're shocked by what you've heard or you're hurt if you start having a physical experience because you empathize with them or you start to realize that, oh my God, they were going through that and I had no idea. And, and then it starts being more about you and how you didn't help them and what you should have done and could have done. You know, that is a, a big ask of us as human beings because we have empathy and compassion. Um, and when we're listening to somebody, to hold back our, our reaction to it takes training, it takes skill, but it's priceless. And for my own personal journey, my husband, when I was at my lowest point, I'd, I'd been helping loads of people. I was very successful in business. I was struggling with my own daughter and I didn't want to ask for help because I didn't want anyone to know that I, like, I'm a coach and I, 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 but I couldn't do it for myself. I realized I hadn't asked for anybody to help me. And, and the, how I got out of it was just giving my husband two questions and saying, if I'm whinging about what's not working, just ask me what I'd like to have happen or what is working. Because it, that's what, and that's what, it was just two questions that changed everything for me. And, and that won't be necessarily the same for every person that's listening to this. But when you, it, yeah, I, it, this courage thing is you can't explain the, the impact it has when someone really listens and also how much it can really hurt and have an impact when someone doesn't listen. And at the same time, I think we forget that most of us find it really, even me as a trained listener, it's a, it's a conscious decision to do it. You have to consciously switch that off, switch that off and give this person your undivided attention. And that's where the time monsters come in. If you don't know how long they're going to be talking for and you've got to hold this attention, it, it, it's challenging. So it takes courage to listen to somebody and it takes courage to be listened to because they're both, you're going into very unfamiliar. You don't know what the person's going to say. You don't know what the reaction's going to be. Yeah. So when, if you start doing this with in pairs or we do it in peer support without peer pressure groups, it's about being kind to each other. So um, my husband would ask the question or then, it, then he wouldn't listen afterwards. And it was like, well, at least he asked the question. You know, <laughs> really celebrate the small changes that go on. And this is not criticizing him because I love him today. We're, we're really good friends. and We've got an amazing relationship. But when you're trying to change behavior, none of it happens instantly. And I think once you've worked out what you want, sometimes you think, well, it might have taken you months to work out what you want. And then you give the instruction and you expect the other person to instantly become able to do what you want them to do. Um, but that is why people pay for professional listeners, because then you're guaranteed to get what you're asking for, because you can recruit or employ people to do the, the kind of listening you want to do. But if you're going to do it with friends and family, remember it's, it's difficult on both sides of the, the coin, the listener and the listened to. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a change of behaviour for everybody. Yeah, and you're right. And it does go back to that it takes time. It takes time to do yeah. those things. And thank you for being, you know, for being so personal as well, um, you know, and honest and honest you know for everyone who's watching this as well um I mean obviously it, we're almost at the end now anyway but I just want to say um your book and I really do need to read it by the way <laughs> I've just had a load of delivery if you want me to get one sent you I really do I really do need to read your book master your inner critic I think a lot of people need to have this book I feel like People need to be in your community as well, whether they feel it's right for them. Yeah. But but I really do what you were if, saying. If you don't feel you're heard and understood, the chances are you're not hearing and understanding yourself. And that can only come when you've got other people that are practicing the same thing at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, family and friends are not always on the same journey with us at the same time. Yeah. 
and I'm going to join. So, so you will see me in your community. That'd be great. Um, yeah, I feel what you're saying needs to be said. I feel like there needs to, there needs, where have you been all this time? Wow. I, I, I think now. I've done a lot of talking and told everybody where I am, but obviously now you've raised the, I've made my awareness. I obviously need to talk some more. Maybe I've been listening for too long and now it's back to talking. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's my turn to talk again. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because, you know, you're a motivational speaker and I can see definitely as to why you do what you do. You're giving people something that has been suppressed in people for such a long time, which is their voice. Yeah. You're giving, giving something that's so powerful, freedom. Yeah. Big thing, big thing to someone. Big thing to someone. Can I just leave everybody with one thing? What, if you're going to have a go at this, remember where you started and make sure that every time you're noticing what's a little bit better than it was last time and celebrate it physically like yay yay talk about the stuff that's a little bit better than it was last time as much as you moan about it wow if you give it as much energy and much time as much attention so if you like oh for goodness sake you never listen to your husband maybe not that i've said it that way of course <laughs> but when he gets it right go do you know what the way you listen today that was absolutely spot on that really really helped even if they only lasted 20 seconds of listening really well, make sure, because it was probably only about 20 seconds where they happened to say the wrong word or they didn't seem to respond in the right way that made you feel like they weren't listening. But, you know, give as much attention to the stuff that's going well and verbalise that and express it with as much energy and enthusiasm and time and attention as you do the stuff that didn't work so well, because that will instantly balance your system and their system up when you're catching each other getting things right. And that goes back to settling the brain state because this work can only be done if we know and we recognize what is working whilst trying to undo and change the stuff that isn't working as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's been abs an absolutely amazing pleasure to have you on here. We're gonna have a beautiful, beautiful uh, link below um so you can read about taming your own time monsters so you can look at that and you can then grow start growing your listening courage so so to speak yeah. um well, having time to listen i think that's the tame the time monsters is, is really that the biggest thing people say to me while they don't listen is they haven't got time and they're under time pressure so the first thing is to change the story and the relationship you have with time, if that's the reason you're giving yourself for not listening to yourself or other people. And that's a free guide with um, the seven steps to ten your time on to. Oh, fabulous. So we'll make sure we've got everything on here because I really, I really feel you need to follow this lady. I just Thank you. Yeah, I just think what you're doing is absolutely phenomenal and it is courageous, very courageous. Thank you. Um, I can see you just like raising the confidence of just, so, oh, you're already doing it to be fair, of just so many people. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone who's watched today. Um, and I will be back next week with our next social media switch off. Thank you very much. Speak soon. Bye. Bye.